Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Growth Marketing Webinar Series brought to you by Business to Community, Growth Marketing Conference, and Bullpine Interactive. And we have a special sponsor of the day today, Autopilot. I'm very excited for today's webinar. I'm Derek Haney, CEO of Bullpine Interactive, a San Diego-based social media marketing agency, and head of content and social media at Growth Marketing Conference. The recording of this presentation will be available within 48 hours, and we'll be sending out an email to give you access to it, so don't worry about it. Now please, if you have any questions, ask them in the chat as we're going about uh, th this conversation, and we will be answering them uh, mostly in real time today. So uh, make sure to ask as many questions as you can, and we'll make this fun and interactive for everyone. Now if you learned something today, and you will certainly be learning something, don't hesitate to take a screen grab or something like that and share it on Twitter. Use hashtag GrowthMarketingConf, and you can at GrowthTactics, at Guy underscore Marion, at AutopilotUS, at BLeongSF, and at Range underscore Me. And me, I'm at Six Peppers. I'll share all of that with you in just a second in the chat. We've got an amazing talk lined up for you right now. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Guy Marion, Brandon Leon, and Kevin Klein. I'm just going to introduce Guy and let him take it from there. Guy Marion is Chief Marketing Officer in Growth at Autopilot, a visual marketing software for automating customer journeys. Guy spearheads Autopilot's go-to marketing strategy, growth, and operations. Prior to Autopilot, Guy worked as Head of Online Sales at Zendesk, VP of, and General Manager of CollabNet, and CEO of Co what is it, Codision? Codision. <laughs> uh, I already forgot. <laughs> Cohesion. Ah, it looks so tricky to say. Uh, <laughs> Guy blogs regularly, is a contributor to Forbes, CMO.com, and VentureBeat, and is a speaker at events like Growth Marketing Conference and Dreamforce. It uh, has been a pleasure in the past to introduce Guy, and it is certainly a pleasure again to introduce you uh, to the Growth Marketing Webinar Series. Guy, I will let you take it away from here and introduce Brandon and Kevin. Thanks very much, Derek, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to have you joining us, or this afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Um, thanks, Kevin. That, or thanks, thanks there, Derek. That was a pretty nice long intro. <laughs> but uh, I'm most excited today about the, uh, the participants that we have here, my special guest today. Um, as you mentioned, we have both Brandon Leong and Kevin Klein, who I'll introduce in just a second. But what we're going to be talking about today is how this startup, this phenomenal company that, um, that uh, both Kevin and Brandon are with, have uh, grown, so seen some of the most rapid growth I've seen in working with customers in the last couple of years. They've grown 18x in 10 months, and last year won the Shop.org Digital Commerce Startup of the Year Award, which is a very prestigious award in the e-commerce space. Um, and you know they've been very kind and uh, and and willing, frankly, to go on record today and share some of their uh, their growth secrets that they're using to, to to achieve this phenomenal growth. So definitely excited about what we're going to cover. Um, as mentioned, we have a hashtag today. Actually, you can use Growth Marketing Conf. Um, you can also tweet at Autopilot US or at Range Me um, to be able to. Uh, get a hold of any of our team members who are monitoring our Twitter handles today. Um, also, feel free to ask questions, um, exactly as Derek mentioned, and we will be monitoring these um, live, and we'll work that in as questions go on. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce, um, first of all, Brandon Leong, who's the Director of Marketing and Growth at RangeMe. Brandon leads a talented um, and energetic marketing team that really is focused on the growth of the RangeMe marketplace. He brings with him a unique, a unique blend of high volume user acquisition as well as enterprise demand gen experience and has held senior marketing roles for a decade at companies like Query, Aria Systems, and, um, and importantly, Brandon is both a husband and a native San Francisco. So Brandon, great to have you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Uh, and uh, you know, Brandon also, we often talk about Brandon internally at Autopilot <laughs> being one of the people that we think about when we think about those who are out there maximizing the use of journeys and automation. Like he's a, uh, he's a, he's a one-stop mind of both hacks, frameworks, and growth. So uh, excited to finally have you on record with us here. <laughs> um, and then Kevin is a veteran of building customer success teams. He's a VP of customer success at RangeMe. Um, prior to that, he was uh, the founding member of the B2B team at Prezi. And there he built and scaled the customer success and business support operations programs, working with customers from verticals and geographies around the world. And here at RangeMe, 
he's, um, he's driving the success organization as the VP. Great to have you. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks, Scott. All right, so before we jump in, just to get a sense of who you all are, and thank you for taking your uh, Tuesday morning with us here, if you could just take a second to respond to the survey, how many years have you been using marketing automation? Never less than a year, one to three years, or more than three years. If you could just fill that out, we'll take about 20 seconds here to gauge the, uh, the audience so that we can sort of moderate how we're uh, presenting accordingly. Um, so, so far, we're looking like we're at about half never and about um, actually about a third never and two thirds one to three years and um, okay so we're about half of people on the about half of respondents so far looks like we're about a third of never used marketing automation and then there's, a, there's an even spread of less than a year one to three years and more than three years so we have a good moderate cloud here good in mix. terms of good a mix. good mix can learn a lot today so that's fun great all right Thank you. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Brandon here, who's going to give us a first introduction as to what RangeMe is. Thanks a lot, uh, guys. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, so RangeMe is um, you know, an award-winning online marketplace that streamlines the discovery process between retailers and product suppliers. Um, what that means for non-industry people is um, on one side we have amazing retailers um, that are using our, our, uh, our platform to discover amazing products for their stores. Um, and we also streamline that process for them. So we standardize all the supplier proposals that come through to them, and they're able to see it in a nice, concise format, similar to online shopping. Um, on the other side of the marketplace, we have our 55,000 wonderful suppliers and growing, um, and they represent consumer products from all over the world. Um, and you know, I think the mission for Nikki, when she, when Nikki Jackson, our founder, when she came into the, um, you know, kind of this, this marketplace was, look, can we find a way to get suppliers a foot in the door um, where it's been so difficult for them in the past? Um, and I think we've, we've achieved um, a lot in the last, uh, i just say, a year and a half, and we're really excited about our growth. And Brandon, what was the uh, initial uh, inspiration or source of founding the company? So um, the company was founded two and a half years ago in Australia. And then about a year and a half ago, we launched in the U.S. with Target Corporation. You guys, I'm sure you guys know, all know who Target is as our first um, retailer in the U.S. Um, and the genesis of the company was, like I, like I mentioned earlier, so Nikki Jackson, our founder, she had a, um, a, a, a baby skincare product. Um, and she had actually been in the CPG, consumer packaged goods industry, for a very long time. She'd worked for Kellogg's. She'd worked for Pepsi. She'd worked for, for different large CPG companies. So she had some inroads. Um, but she quickly realized that getting the foot in the door for her product and getting uh, retail buyers to actually see it was near impossible. And the amount of cost and time that it took to be able to do that was, you know, it, it was severely fragmented, inefficient, and it was really like, you know, the one in a million chance, right, that dream. Um, and so she set out to find a way to be able to, stre to streamline that process, make it more efficient, and thus giving suppliers product suppliers, equal footing with some of these big guys, um, and, and, and uh, in, in turn allowing retailers to discover innovation that they might not have never seen before. And so now you've picked up along the way, I mean, some of these retailers here are the biggest in the world, Target, Whole Foods, Safeway, <laughs> Albertsons, these are some terrific customers. Maybe Kevin, for you a little bit, can you give us a breakdown of the types of uh, both the retailers and the suppliers that you're working with? Yeah, it's really fun working with two very different user base. But uh, it, it's, it's interesting to note that the value is actually the interaction between the two sides. So despite being very different customers, the, the value is them interacting with each other. So clearly the uh, same that goes on the acquisition side, the way that you um, work post-sales with these customers, is, uh, uh, it, it's very different. So one side we have this uh, more enterprise type customer acquisition, more enterprise account management. With, with the big retailers, you know, we're doing account management with Target, Whole Foods, Albertsons, all of these big guys have you know, dedicated account managers. Whereas you know, on the supplier side, we have over 55,000 and they're coming in uh, rapidly. So to be able to onboard them, um, you know, these unique brands, and it can be anything that you see in, in Whole Fru Foods from the, uh, from the or organic granola aisle to you know, any product that you see in Target. So it's, it's very diverse on the, on the supplier side. And, definitely scaled. Right. 
So maybe walk through just for the audience's understanding here, what, is, uh, what does that experience look like for a new supplier, perhaps who's wanting to become a supplier to Whole Foods, um, one of these 55,000 suppliers with 190,000 products? What does that experience look like when they um, apply to and become a supplier? Yeah, so before Range Me, it was a, a very difficult process. They would have to send samples, they'd have to get on the phone, cold call, uh, LinkedIn message, and most likely not get any feedback or never get heard. Mm -hmm. Now with Range Me, they can be directed from the retailer, and Brandon will probably get into this yeah. on, on the acquisition side, but they'll be directed from a retailer to, to post their, their products on Range Me. So, you know, we have 55,000 suppliers, but each, each of them are posting, you know, potentially dozens of products. Mm -hmm. So you can see how kind of the, our, our customer database is, is built out. Um, so they post all their products and then someone from the retailers can go in there and, and review them. Great. All right, so um, Brandon, back to you a little bit. Let's talk about this is the growth. Fun side. Yeah. yeah, the fun side. So, um, you know, this is a, this, up and to the right is always slides people love to see. 18x user acquisition growth in 10 months. Tell us a little bit about, first of all, um, you know, what's driving these growth rates so far? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's it, you know, looking at this chart always makes me kind of give me the tingles because, so when I joined this company in, in October, um, it was Greenfield, right? We just, I think we had about a thousand suppliers um, and, you know, it was, you know, it was, it was slow going. And um, we really set out to kind of enhance that and, you know, start, you know, growing the marketplace on both sides. So as you know, for a marketplace, it's always difficult mm -hmm. because if you have too fast growth on one side and slow growth on the other side, you don't have a balanced marketplace. The other side of the marketplace isn't seeing value. Um, so, so for us, it was trying to find a balance between getting a lot of, a lot of suppliers in so there's enough for the retailers to see, mm -hmm. right? not enough products for the retailers to see, but then also getting those retailers in so that there's, um, there's a kind of that, that, that kind of the, the, the end goal for these suppliers that, that exists, right, the carrot, right? So they, they know that, they, that there are buyers on the other side that are going to look at their products, right? Um, so, you know, it was a very balanced attack, and I think that, you know, what we did was, was pretty exciting. We, we grew from... 1,500 suppliers in January mm -hmm. to 50,000 in kind of towards Q4 of, of, uh, of 2016. Mm -hmm. um, now we're, we're over 55, nearly 60,000 suppliers. We're, we're growing at a clip of 1,000 suppliers a week. Those are B2B companies. Mm -hmm. We're growing at a clip of 1,000 suppliers per week. And on the retailer side, I mean, when you look back at that, at that last slide, um, I mean, Albertson Safeway, um, uh, Whole Foods Market, Sprouts, Target, Petco, Sephora, mm -hmm. Ajo USA, I can just keep going. And every one of those, those retailers, if you go to their website and you want to submit a product as a supplier, you have to go through, you have to go through Range Me, mm -hmm. right? So that fuel did fuel a lot of our growth. So we saw like knowing that the end goal was getting into retail for these suppliers. So how can we make it in, in a way where these retailers are also helping drive the growth that, we, that, we, that they, they, they want as well on the other side of the marketplace? Um, and the result, as you can see, 18x growth in acquisition, which is huge, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and those amazing logos on the retailer side. So we're really excited about it, yeah. Nice. So you've said a few uh, sort of patented brand in terms over time. <laughs> Ecosystem over channels. Can you tell me what, what does that mean? Um, so one of the things is like, you know, typical channel marketers and the way people think about, um, you know, when you're doing high, high volume acquisition or, or any lead generation is, you, you hit a bunch of channels and then you find the channel that works or the channels that work and you, and you, and you push hard on the gas pedal, right? Um, I'm more, you know, the way I think about it is it's all an ecosystem. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I think I wrote an article for, for Autopilot um, a couple months ago. And what it was, it was about is, you know, what the, the ecosystem is what you're building around your target market, mm -hmm. right? And making sure that when they need you, that you're going to be there, mm -hmm. right? So it's not any one particular channel that drives all the growth. Mm -hmm. It's all the channels working in tandem mm -hmm. to be able to create a kind of bubble around these guys mm -hmm. so that they know that you exist and they know that when they're ready to get their products in front of retailers, that Range Me is the, is the place to do that. Got it. That being said, you are running a lot of channels, right? Yeah. So if we, let's go ahead and sort of, I think another thing that you do really well is in addition to driving growth, you've really f taken a methodical approach full, fully yeah. through the life cycle of your suppliers and your customers. Maybe um, 
we want to take a chance to sort of break out a little bit yeah, sure. from when you first acquire and drive initial uh, supplier interest through to how they convert into becoming customers and then how they over time recognize value from being part of this ecosystem. Do you mind just breaking us through this customer life cycle? Yeah. So if you look at the channels on the left hand side, like as I mentioned, um, you know, regardless of how hard you push the gas pedal on any one of these kind of channels, you'll see growth in all the channels respectively, right? So if you push hard on CPC, you're going to see a little bit of more growth in retargeting, you see growth in referrals because we're now working in this day and age with the educated consumer, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to be looking at every single, they're going to do as much research as possible before they commit their time and their dollars to a solution, right? Um, so this ecosystem is really, really important. And these are just some of the channels that we use to kind of get the word out and, and, and help convert these guys when they're ready to convert. Um, the, uh, on the supplier side, we're actually very lucky. Um, you know, our messaging is to a point where um, you know, we have a very short cycle. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's not your traditional kind of long-term like lead generation for, for most B2B companies. This is like direct to sign up and people are seeing value very, very quickly. So that's a great job to my content guys and, and you know, just being able to maximize the voice and, and, and the words that we're getting out there. Um, and on the, on the flip side, you know, we, we do some unique things. I think, Marion, you, you love the Hotel California thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I must say that I did not create that. That was something that I heard from a very amazing marketer at a, at a conference. But Hotel California is, you know, a way to be able to nurture these guys with, with relevant and, and um, you know, kind of amazing content um, that they can, you know, they can't get out of. You can check in, but you can't check, can check out. out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is a way, you know, to... You know, these, uh, the CPG and retail industry is, a, is another example of an industry that's starved for content. Just like you guys are here. You guys are here listening to us talking about marketing, right? Um, the C CPG and retail is no, is no different. Um, actually, probably even more so knowing how antiquated the, a lot of the systems and the way things are, are, the way business is done on that side. So, you know, all this new content and everything that we're creating is absolutely kind of these trigger points for these guys. And, mm -hmm. you know, the way you, do, the way you kind of um, feed that to them is, 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 is through these channels and creating that ecosystem. System, so. Got it. Okay, so basically what we're looking at here is you are working paid and non-paid channels to attract yes. suppliers to the various properties that make up your entire collective range meet ecosystem, yes, right? So all your traditional retailers as well as others. And so email, cost per click, so paid search programs, social retargeting efforts, a lot of referrals you're driving, yep. and your partnership yep. are driving people to fill out leads. So for example, someone goes to, for example, earlier Whole Foods and applies to become a supplier. There, sure. Right? Um, so then from there, they go through the Hotel California lead nurturing process, right? If, if, if they don't sign up, yes. If, like they don't, would, yeah. if they don't sign up right away, yeah, then yeah. they um, are entering into a nurture program. A very scale, yeah. We'll, we'll look at that. In a and we'll bit. go into that in yeah. a second. All right. So that's sort of the first area where you're really been driving an automation process yeah. to increase your yields yeah. of interest to onboarding customers. Well, right? all of this runs, yeah. uh, the beauty of this, all of this runs through autopilot. <laughs> so, nice. I mean, every single channel is, has uh, internally has one road and then that road leads always back to autopilot. So that's, that's kind of cool. And um, I think this is the slide where we get to talk about how autopilot is, is a little bit different, right? Like how Kevin and my customer success, on, on our customer success team is like taking these signups, mm -hmm. seamlessly onboarding them through one tool, mm -hmm. and we're all using it. So this, I think that's pretty amazing. It is pretty yeah. amazing. You know what? On that point, let's go ahead and jump forward because I want to get into that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think this is a. I think this is a good a good drop off. I think another point you guys have done a nice job of is clarifying where you know you've got different departments internally using your automation systems, yeah. right? You've got yourself, Brandon, your teams using a, a driving initial channel acquisition and conversion to customers. Uh, you know, from there, Kevin, you've got your onboarding journey that you've built out, and then there's a product team as well focused on using to drive activation and value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. On the customer success side, we have to work really closely with, with the marketing team because it is, I mean, this funnel is one cohesive journey that, that we put together. Right. Um, okay, cool. So before we jump into the journeys, just really quickly, um, you know, you've mentioned a couple of times now one of your keys to success has been uh, implementing best of breed tools, mm -hmm. building a growth stack, yeah. and enabling you to scale without having an army of, of <laughs> internal employees, given the size of your, uh, given the size of your onboarding uh, program and number of, uh, of new suppliers you've been growing with. Can you talk us a little bit through the stack that you've built out at this point? Yeah, I think, um, and I'll, I guess I'll just shut out real quickly. Like, this isn't something 
um, that's you know that, that this is. Uh, I'm pretty sure that most of you guys have heard, other than other than RangeMe and possibly Chartio, most of you guys have heard of Instapage. Most of you guys have probably heard of Salesforce. That's the breed. Um, one of the great things about being able to use an agile tool like Autopilot is instead of having to conform to like, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm an old Marketo user, I've used HubSpot, I've used Pardot, I've used them all, right? Instead of having to conform to kind of, you know, their methodology and the stacking your own methodology on top of that methodology to be able to create something that's automated, um, you're able to use breast of breed that's out there, plug it in, and it's, it's a lot easier for you to like, hey, I, you know, I know how to use this page, it's easy and it's fun to use, and you know what? They have a, a seamless integration with Autopilot, so I'm using best of breed landing, landing page designers. I don't have to go to product to create landing pages for me. I don't have to create landing pages within the, tool, within the Autopilot tool itself. Mm -hmm. I can use whatever I want, and it, and, it, and it seamlessly integrates. And of course, you know, having it integrate with our, with our own processes and our own API from our product is, was really big for us because, as you know, we have such a robust marketplace, right? Right, right. So that to be able to seamlessly grow. And then also, you guys all know Salesforce, right? So Salesforce is an easy one. And I'll let Kevin talk a little bit more about that and how that's important to us in, in, in what we do. Yeah, in, in past roles in customer success, there, there was the challenge of having customer, like relevant customer information accessible to you, right? Like what things like usage data, subscription data, um, we're lucky enough to have all that kind of flowing into Salesforce, mm -hmm. which is really easy to integrate into our marketing automation tool. So we can run any type of personalized programs or customized programs based off of activity that, that makes it really simple. So having kind of this network, and, and one that we're missing is, is Zendesk. So mm -hmm. our team is pretty much across Salesforce, Autopilot, and Zendesk throughout the day. Mm -hmm. and, and that allows us to scale you know, these thousands of suppliers that are, that are signing up a month. Mm. Interesting. So if I could summarize from what I've just heard, the two sort of drivers when you built the stack. One is um, having best of breed tools that empower your marketing and growth teams to be able to be targeted and data driven in how you're engaging customers, but without depending on product to be building landing pages or passing data. Is that exactly. and yeah. the second thing is you need to be able to pull your data together so you can create triggers and segmentation in real time? Sure. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, good. Well let us proceed then and let's go ahead and now transition <laughs> from the background and let's go ahead and jump <laughs> into um, the first journey. So we on these webinars we always love to go into what people are actually doing and how you're actually using, um, you know, how you've actually built out automation to support key needs. And so we've pulled out three pearls of wisdom today from the RangeMe team. And the first is the way in which you're acquiring new leads and converting those initial areas of interest, in, those inquiries into uh, actual potential customers mm -hmm. and how you've substantially increase that conversion rate through in better and improved nurturing. So maybe if you could take us through um, what, you, what we're showing on the screen here right now. Yeah. Um, just before, before I know, uh, before we talk about the journey itself, so I, I, when we took that survey earlier, mm -hmm. um, uh, most of the people, a bulk of the people were one year or less mm -hmm. or never used marketing mm -hmm. automation. Mm -hmm. um, so I want you to know, so the person um, that you see on the screen, her name is Winnie, um, and she's my marketing coordinator. Um, when, she, when, I, when, she, when, I, when we hired her and she started working for me, she had zero marketing automation experience. She had few months of marketing under her belt. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the journey that she's built, right, this is someone who, for all intents and purposes, have been has been marketing for one year now, right, and is able to build complex and, you know, really robust email um, acquisition journeys and did journeys in general, right? She's, she's, she's deep in the tool. She's, she's probably better used than I am now. Mm -hmm. I don't like to admit that. Okay. Don't, is this live? Like she, this she, is live. Okay. She knows now. <laughs> she, she knew before. <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, she, she, she knows. Um, but let's, I mean, so, so keep that in mind, guys. Like this might look overwhelming when you first see it, but it's not. And this is, a, like I said, this is a person who had never used marketing automation before building this. Um, and it's really just about logic. And, and building a methodology and, and a flow that makes sense, right, for your users. Um, so let's go into it very, very quickly, um, which, you know, which we can actually. So if you think about, um, this is an example, example that we use. Say you have a list, right? And I know a lot of you marketers, you guys send emails off of a list. So you, so you guys get a list from someone, um, and you want to do an A-B test, right? Very, very simple. So what you see there in that, in that purple kind of shape there is, an, is a very easy way to visualize what an A-B test will look like and how you will split the journey into two. So if you think about it, the methodology that exists here 
it doesn't change with the tool that you're using. The me methodology of marketing still exists while you're doing this, and it's all visual. Um, and then as you go along the flow, you'll start seeing condition checks, which means if they've done this, then I'll send this email. If they've done this, then I'll send this email. But really what, what it's about is knowing your customer, learning about them during this journey, and being able to serve them the right information at that time. Right? And if you look at some of the field updates as well, what it does is it feeds that information back into Autopilot and in Salesforce so we learn more constantly about the user that we're marketing to. Um, and of course there's an ejection flow. So if they do sign up, which a lot of times they do, um, they'll be taken out of this journey so that they won't be continuing, continuously serve kind of acquisition type of materials, but then we'll go directly into uh, Kevin's journey um, of onboarding. So it's nice and seamless, and the way that it's been set up, like I said, it follows a simple, logical flow, a very easy methodology to understand. Um, with the results being, I mean, if you think about someone who's never done any of this stuff before and be able to um, you know, accomplish an 82.3% open rate. I think that's a, is that above industry average? I, I think that's it is. It is, right? Is it? Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and a 42 point. You're and doing a, well, right? And You're a 42% well. percent click rate. You that's, 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 that's good too, right? I think that's okay, yeah. I mean, it's funny because when I, when I would talk to Winnie about this, like I've been marketing for a long time, so to see that, I'm like, oh my God, something's wrong about the data. <laughs> I'm like, that's wrong. That's, that's 100% wrong. And for her, she's like, no, no, that's, that's kind of what we've been at. And that's what we've gotten to. And, and for her, it was, it was very matter of fact. Like, hey, you know what? You know, this is this. She she knows that it's going to convert this way because she's built a journey that's, you know, been able to just be very, very simple, very, very straightforward. And like I said, follows the user on on, on an amazing journey. And it's visualized here while it's working. So, Brandon, how? So, in this journey we're showing right now, as you said, you're running an A/B split task sure. right off the trigger. So yep. you're triggering from a list upload. Yep. So Winnie uploads a list, you've built this journey, and when she does, that immediately triggers this journey. Yes. You're split testing into two different paths where yep. you're sending two different sets of email drip nurtures. Yep. Are you randomly doing A-B tests throughout all your journeys on a regular basis, or do you tend to more <laughs> sort of predetermine outcomes that you want, like you want to send it to your beer suppliers versus your wine suppliers, and use that as an approach to splitting? Um, so we do a lot of that um, depending on, let's, let's say, so here's an example. Um, if you guys, if you have a list from a, a, a trade show and uh, the trade show is all of beverages, yeah, you can break it up into kind of the different kind of, of subcategories. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, we've gotten to a point now, and Winnie's gotten to a point where we've, we're, we're past that now. So we've seen... Um, kind of grouped behaviors mm -hmm. from different segments, and now we've been able to, to, to say, okay, you know what, this group of persona mm -hmm. will go well in this specific journey, and then we'll split from that. And then right? you're doing random testing to exactly. identify different conditions there. Absolutely, right, and, right. and that's how smart this is able to be. And like, and you know, I think that what you're saying and how of how we segment these guys. Um, Kevin has a really cool example that we're going to get into about okay. how that happens once they, be, once they get in the phone and how smart we actually can be with this tool. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, we're, <laughs> we're, we're actually going to stop using slides and dive into it in a second. So right before we do so, though, a couple other pearls before we go off. So I have a question for you, yeah. um, and I'm asking this partially loaded because Autopilot is soon about <laughs> to release new capabilities that allow you to really track conversions. Yep. But do you think about a conversion event on every journey that you build? And if so, like for example here, what would be a conversion event coming out of this particular journey? Um, conversion event would be, a, um, I mean, well, let's take the easiest one, sign up. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, so if they sign up, they are ejected in, uh, from from this particular flow and then put into another one. Okay. Which is, um, you know, that's the easiest one. But if you're asking for like a more a more complicated one, like um, let's say we do, like we have some complicated some more complicated flows that depending on you know kind of where they've been their their life cycle, so the touches that they've had, but then kind of the reciprocal actions that we've seen from it. Mm -hmm. If there hasn't been much movement, um, they might go end up going into some Hotel California E type thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we do have we do have these types of kind of um, deeper user segmentation based on activity. Yeah. Um, and, and and once these journeys are finished, once once a specific journey is finished, we need segmented in a way that she can gather all that information and build more intelligent journeys after that. And yeah. then actually take these guys and um, have them in the list and then be able to segment them that way and like say, so who goes in here, who goes in here, who do we keep going after, who do we kind of just say that these guys aren't, might not actually be people yep, <laughs> and, yep. and, and uh, that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, um, the, the, the cool part about it, like I said, is uh, as, as the head of marketing at Range, I get to just look at the awesome results and, mm -hmm. and when he gets to 
gets to play with it. But yeah, whenever I dive in there, it's always like 50 iterations past what I've seen, mm -hmm. and then she has to sit down and explain it to me like a child. And, uh, and answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, yeah, but like I said, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, you have a person, and, and I'm going to keep saying this, you have a person who has a year of marketing experience mm -hmm. building these complex journeys because it's logical, it's easy to use, and you don't have to use dual methodology, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to learn the methodology of the tool and then your own methodology. It's one methodology, yeah. right? And it goes, and, and, and it's visual. Right. So. So, question: Text versus HTML. Do you use either? Oh. Both? Um, Marketing nerd. Yes. <laughs> it, or is it very based on the journey and based on the time? It's very based on the journey, um, but I would say that um, you know, at any particular time, text emails do work very, very well. Yes. Extremely, extremely well. Extremely well. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I. But yeah, I mean. You know, there are certain times where uh, you just need templates, right? Like, mm -hmm. it just, like, especially if you're, like, you know, if you're, if you're inviting someone to a, a webinar, mm -hmm. it's nice to be visual. If you're, right. if you're uh, you know, sending out a newsletter, kind of have to be visual. If you're sending out an infographic, mm -hmm. you got to be visual, right. right? There are certain applications where just text doesn't work, right? right? right. Um, so I don't like this to kind of, kind of confine it to, like, hey, you, if you send text emails, you're going to have this higher conversion. No, it's really about who you're, who, what the type of content you're, you're like you just said, it's all situational. Right. The type of content, the, 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 the time and place during the funnel that you're kind of reaching out to them, yep. and where they are in their life cycle, right? Yep. Um, which, which kind of dictates what that's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about subject lines? Do you do a lot of testing with subject lines? We do. So one of the things that I, um, and here, here's something that, that, that has helped Winnie a lot, and, um, is we, 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 don't, we don't stack test. So if we're testing, Subject lines, we're only testing subject lines, and we're testing body, we're not only testing. So we have apples to apples comparisons, mm -hmm. right, to everything. Um, but yeah, we, we, we'll test all the way down. She has different journeys for, like, just testing subject lines, mm -hmm. um, testing calls to action, mm -hmm. testing um, uh, uh, landing page. So yep. She has different journeys that are just doing all of those things always in the background. Yep. She's always constantly learning and then spitting them back into the main journey to be able to do that. Yeah. Right. It's kind of cool. Yeah. And where do you try? Is this all in, Google, in a spreadsheet someplace? Yeah, or um, you... No, no. Well, 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 Autopilot does a lot of that for us. Yeah. Right? So the cool part about it is we know where every single person's been in every single journey. Um, we know how they, what kind of the activity in every single journey that they've had. So it's a lot. It's pretty and to the conversion in every journey. Mm -hmm. So Winnie knows pretty much to a T. You know, um, in her subject line um, uh, journey, like you know which which garnered the best open rate. Yeah. Right. Um, and then in her in her landing page journeys, like, which had the best conversion. So she, she, right. she's able to run that all on her own, which is great. Yeah. And it's all housed in autopilot, which is awesome. Great. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, listen, we're going to advance to the second pearl here, which is... Um, making me look bad. This is the making me look bad. <laughs> <laughs> Personalizing your onboarding. So I think the reason why you're saying this makes you look bad is um, initially Brandon um, implemented autopilot, built out journeys for all aspects of the life cycle, yep. and then since then has transitioned. So maybe <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, so Brandon, you built out V1 of your onboarding journey, and then and um, transition that to Kevin, who's taken that on and built that. Um, maybe we'll start off with, uh, with Kevin. Why don't we go straight over yeah. to you? Yeah, um, you didn't even go over mine. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe talk a little bit about when you first arrived at RangeMe and you saw uh, an automated onboarding sequence for the first time, sort of what you saw there and how you've evolved, you know, uh, what your initial take was and what the first changes were that you wanted to make. Yeah, you can see the, the subject here personalized the, the customer onboarding. Through, through no fault of Brandon's own, I think he was more fixated on the conversion point. <laughs> so uh, this, the, the trigger here in, in both instances is post-conversion, so post-sign-up. Okay. Um, and, and you see this every service that you sign up to um, nowadays will we'll send a welcome email, and a lot of times it's just, you know, hi, welcome to whatever service it is that you signed up. So it, the, the initial iteration of, of this journey that the guy's pulling up is, uh, was very much um, geared towards that, just like getting them in and started looking at a little bit of customizing what we were trying to, to optimize. Um, so the, the thing that we were trying to optimize in this journey, and I think it's, it's really important for, you know, if you're on customer success or if you're a customer marketer, to set what those kind of goals are for you to optimize, um, not just getting them in and making sure they've, they've signed in, but what's like the long-term value for, for the customer. Um, so rather than just saying welcome, think about, what, what is it that you want them to do or what experience do you want them to have? So for us, the, 
um, the metric or the experience that we were optimizing was for these suppliers, getting them to upload their, their first product. So that's kind of the, the onboarding measurement and the milestone that we've set. So you've signed up, now it's time to post your first product. And is that a KPI that you're monitoring? And, and what's your time frame within which you're hoping them to do so? Yeah, so it, it varies and it, the, the journey kind of goes on for several weeks if, if they don't accomplish that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of suppliers, and, and when, we, when we walk you through this, this journey, I'll talk a little bit about that. A lot of suppliers post their product on the first day. You know, the majority of them do, but some um, take a little bit of prodding to, to get them back in there to, to post their products to actually achieve value. And, and when we showed that kind of that funnel, um, the, the business funnel that, that showed that the different channels that were requiring them, the section for, for customer success is, is onboarding and then value. So we always love to use that term, like how, how do we help drive value, uh, which will eventually lead to upgrade, which again is another customer success um, marketing partnership. And was uploading the first product your initial goal as, a, as your outcome, your goal for the onboarding period because it was just intuitively obvious that if you're going to be using RangeMe, that's what you need to have done? Or is it because of the fact that this was a major break point that if you saw people achieve this, they would be more likely to go on to become a successful supplier? Or? Yeah, well, essentially if you don't upload a product, you're not going to be, be seen. So if you do not accomplish this, this uh, this one step, you're actually not going to achieve. Stakes, yeah. yeah, you're not going to achieve any any value. I think we, when I joined, we kind of shifted from uh, just the number of products to number of suppliers with products as as a more important growth measurement. Um, and you know, uh, when we walk you through this, we'll we'll show you how we really increase that number um, by optimizing towards that one thing. Well, let's go ahead and do that. Well, let's go ahead and jump in. If you, um, I'm going to give you the driver's seat oh, here. The controls, the controls. <laughs> and maybe if you just talk us through a little bit, um, you know, this journey, is, obviously it's fairly large, um, but if you could break it into some bite-sized chunks, starting with maybe the trigger, and you've got a couple things going on here. You've got, a, you've got an on-site message, and you've got emails. Maybe if we start off there. Yeah, yeah. So, again, the, the trigger here, what adds all of these suppliers to this journey is once they've completed their sign-up. Um, so as soon as they sign up, as soon as Brandon hands them over from, from marketing, they're added to this journey. So essentially instantly when they sign up, they get a, a welcome email that does a little bit more explaining. Our, our sign up process is very lean at, to try and make it frictionless. Mm -hmm. um, and we've gone through several iterations of what this first welcome email is, um, but we want to explain a little bit more of what exactly they're getting into and why it's so important. And understanding the customer's motivation at this point was a huge breakthrough for us. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of brute force your way to get someone to do something through email automation, but we really wanted to help create this partnership with them so they, they understand that you know, we're, we're their partner to help them get into Whole Foods or Target or whatever it may be. So that personalization, and it was a simple personalization field that, that was, you know, what channel did you sign up through? Mm -hmm. If your referred retailer uh, was and that's, that's the, the internal name that we have for it, was Target, you know, it's more impactful to receive an information uh, or receive an email that says uh, getting into Target starts here versus retailers, because then you see us as, as your partner with working with these retailers. So you're literally initially um, welcoming people based on the initial, the channel from which they've been exactly. referred in. Exactly. So that that's, does a really great job at orienting them yep. and, and helps them focus to understand the importance, you know, what value posting their products will have. Right, got it. So you're looking at whether or not their retailer um, uh, field is empty or not. Yeah. If they are empty, you're taking a more generic approach, and if they're mm -hmm. not empty, then you're actually making it specific for specific types of vendors. Ex exactly, retailers, exactly. Yeah. And so this, this welcome email goes out to, to everyone, and then once we move down, um, we do some additional field checks. And we started, uh, what we call implementing a, a, an educational track. As I mentioned, some of these suppliers sign up and instantly would graduate out of this you know, optimiz optimization journey because uh, you know, they posted their product, they've, they've accomplished what it was. But we wanted to really you know, get them used to the idea of us being uh, a leader in, in CPG, a leader in retail. So we, we started adding the, this journey that's across the top here that goes out regardless. It's essentially a, it's a simple drip mm -hmm. campaign with uh, content that we put together that, that helps them understand the, essentially the industry and how range me fits into it. Got it. So everyone gets that. This lower journey, which is, looks a little bit more complicated with all the crisscrossing, and 
it was actually even more, more complicated, believe it or not, when we were A-B testing content. Mm -hmm. So just like on the marketing side, uh, we, we A-B tested a lot of content, a lot of subject lines, a lot of calls to actions uh, to get to this point. Mm -hmm. And, and that, uh, kind of that aha moment when, when we understood that you know, we need to show ourselves, because we truly are really close partners with, with these retailers, we need to show that um, in the messaging to, to suppliers. Mm -hmm. So this entire bottom journey is more about prompting them to complete their product and expressing why that's important mm -hmm. for them and, and their business. And again, we're, we're customizing this, this journey based off of that channel that they've signed up through. Got it. And what is this um, heads up message here? Yeah, so uh, we, we implement heads up throughout the journey, mm -hmm. and it's really great. You know, we don't have to have a, another tool to do that. Um, basically, when they've reached a certain part, we built up this kind of persona, and we have a number of sender profiles and, and emails that we send uh, content from because, again, I have a, a team of, of three on the customer success side, and you know, we're talking about thousands of suppliers a month. So we use uh, kind of this customer success persona, which is Louise on, on my team. Um, she's like the, the educational content. She's the, uh, the guide for them. Got so it. we like to embed this in the product because, I mean, I, yeah, I, 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 love, I love emails, but uh, most important. Yeah, maybe it shows what that looks yeah, let's, like. Yeah, let's look at it. And let's do it. I, I, I love sending those emails, but it's actually much more efficient if they're in the product and you can have them look at it. Um, so for this example, if they haven't posted their product within 48 hours, I want to say here, mm -hmm. when they sign in that next time, we show them an inspiration. And, and again, we're using this customization field preferred retailer to let them know that uh, those buyers in, in particular are waiting for them. Um, and so this is Louise from my team. And, and again, we built up that persona that she's going to be the one guiding suppliers mm -hmm. through this journey. And all of our emails come from her, and it's a, it's a nice transition um, from our acquisition side as well. So and it's actually just, really fun because when, like a lot of times she'll, she'll pick up the phone she'll, she'll talk to a lot of these suppliers. Yeah, yeah. We made like, her. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You guided me on this journey. You even helped me become successful. Yeah. So it's kind of cool, yeah. Giving your marketing or customer success side a face um, mm -hmm. and, and one that suppliers or customers get familiar with is, is a really nice touch. Right, exactly. It's a, you know, there's traditionally been the spokesman role for companies mm -hmm. with, you know, companies that engage with the press. Mm -hmm. There's almost in the online and the automation world, particularly with heads up and emails, you know, companies where you sure. define a clear sort of online spokesman in many yeah. ways um, definitely has a huge impact. We see this with quite a lot of our customers. Yeah. Um, it's also a great way for founders to build a high volume relationship with lots of customers. Exactly. CEOs or key executives or key members like your lead customer success rep here. Yeah, yeah. So we wanted to have that. Manager. Yeah, we wanted to have that more personalized feel, mm -hmm. um, despite trying to get thousands of these guys onboarded. And how does the people? What's the response look like to a heads up versus your email? Is they more likely to respond to your heads up, or is it really vary? Well, the, the, the emails are trying to drive them to log in. The, yeah. he, the heads up are, uh, they're not, we don't want them to distract from the goal of them completing their product. Mm -hmm. So it's more supplementary, right? Like let's link them to a support article or let's link them to, to something that would help them. And here you can see it here. It, we want it to be on the customer success side. We want it to be an aid, not a distraction. Right. So um, we're not really optimizing them to, to look at this. We want to optimize them to complete their product. Right. If they need help, this is where we can inject, inject that. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Actually, you know, it's a funny, um, you know, one of the ways that we use the heads up message. So the great thing about this is we don't actually have to go to product mm -hmm. and be like, hey, can you guys put this in products for us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like we can do this while we're part of the journey. Um, how Winnie's been able to use it and what's been really successful for us is she's been able to add a personal touch to getting people, well, for people on the blog. Yeah. Right? So people on the blog that are reading our blog post, because we have a, a tremendous blog, um, is people going in and saying, hey, you know what, sign up. And it's like, you know, it's a person who's, who's there and you, it's, yeah. it's more of a personal touch. And, you know, we saw blog um, um, kind of subscription increase by like, I think, 5x, mm -hmm. you know, just from implementing that one little heads up, yep. right? Um, that when people are reading it, it's just, and it's not obtrusive too, and it looks, and it, it, it's yeah. very clean looking. It looks quite part of the product. Yeah. That's great, yeah. 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 And on the customer success side, people will, will learn in different ways. Some people will learn just by, you know, clicking around, but... This is a nice, again, uh, outlet to, to get customers to engage with additional content if they need it. And right. really helpful for things like new product launches and, and the like. Perfect. Now, do you use an ejection criteria in your onboarding journey to yeah. stop sending messages to people? I think there was one in here. Um, let's find it. 
And just for those on the phone who are not familiar with what the ejection is, yeah. autopilot stops, allows you to define um, non, uh, allows you to exclude oh, people go. out yeah. of journeys with an ejection shape. Yeah, so this journey that you can see kind of goes on for several weeks based off of emails and, and heads up messages. Um, something that happens all the time is that we have crossover from our, our buyer side to the, the other side of the marketplace. They'll sign up for a supplier account, for example. So what we've done here is we've taken all of our major retailer email addresses and use that as an injection criteria. Like we let them get the welcome email in, in the first in this series mm -hmm. so they get that, the experience if that's what they're looking for, but we don't want them to, to keep going throughout this journey if, if, if it's not relevant to them. Um, I think one of the whole reasons that we talk about personaliza personalization is because relevance really works. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys all know that on the marketing side. So we, we don't want to you know, uh, spam our retailers with, with this journey when they don't have products. So that's a really nice feature for us to be able to say, like, you know, you guys shouldn't go on any longer. And, and again, we're using the, the email address to, to filter those guys out. Got it. And what about when they do add that first product? Do you use that as well to check them out of here? Or is it at that point you're telling them, now you've added the first product, here are some other things you can do as well? Yeah, so the, the check fields here, we're, we're not using the eject, we're using the, the, the check field. So it, it, essentially if they've completed that milestone, if they've uploaded their product, then they, they won't continue. Got it. Okay. Good. And um, so, Kevin, you've been working this, this journey now. Do you manage yeah. this day-to-day, -day, or you have someone else doing this, or a combination? It's a combination of myself and, and Louise. Okay. We manage it day-to-day. Uh, -day. And the nice thing is, you know, we, we spent a lot of time kind of optimizing it. I'd say this is version three or four from Brandon's initial uh, <laughs> take on this. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we've uh, we spent a lot of time, but now it's kind of like set it and, and forget it until we want to redo it again. So we're, we're moving on to, to other things and, and optimizing um, other KPIs for us since we feel like we've done a really good job. Right, you've got this drumbeat in place now yeah. to really help define your entire business pro your yeah. customer success process. Exactly, and I, I think the, the last edition that we did up here that I, that I explained this education track, Yes. now the goal is to make, you know, every time we have a new piece of content, leverage that, and it's, it becomes your engagement, it's setting the basis for, for your engagement content to get suppliers to log back in um, or engage with the product or engage with the new release. And that's are those separate. Those, that sort of sounds a little bit like reactivation or retention. Type exactly. Focuses, right? Yeah. So this this specific journey is just activation, mm -hmm. um, just that initial onboarding. But yeah. yeah, we have several other journeys going for for that more engagement content. Got it. Great. Um, all right. Well, thank you for doing the deep dive here. Let us go back up to our uh, our presentation. Um, we've got about ten minutes left in the hour here. Um, so let's see, we do have a couple of questions here that's come up today. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and jump off, jump in here to some of those. Um, oh, it looks like we covered a lot of them in terms of how we answer questions. So we've got 10 minutes left. I want to get to a third point that I think is a third pearl of wisdom that I think uh, RangeMe has done a great job with. And I think some of the reasons why you've gotten these strong results, the 18x increase in growth, you've been driving onboarding activation, you've been converting more of your initial inquiries into actually customers, um, has been the way in which, Brennan, you've delegated out the use of the platform. It's something that we've seen our most successful customers typically do this as well, which is, um, you know, to take a quote that you said on our prep call last week, you sort of let the customer journey or the customer experience drive the automation efforts, not the internal departmental structure. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about to begin with, you know, we know you started individually. How did you evolve from being one person managing all these journeys to having a broader and therefore richer sort of experience across multiple teams? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that we always talk about when, we, when you're looking at uh, on marketing automation, when someone says marketing automation, the very first thing they say is, oh my God, like, like I don't know if I'm ready for that, or, or we don't have someone in, in here that can do this, right? And I think that, you know, what's ended up happening is you, ha you see a lot of organizations have a dedicated person mm -hmm. who sits behind mm -hmm. the machine mm -hmm. and who, who, who gets basically, you know, disparate feedback from all departments, mm -hmm. and, and, and he's kind of, he or she is kind of their, 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 like they're, they're his customer. He's kind of trying to build all of these things for them. But they're all siloed, right? So it's all kind of like, okay, I'm building this for customer success. I'm building this for these guys. I have to work in marketing automation. I have to do all of these things. Um, and for me, it was like, can we, can, is there a way that all of these teams that, that are 
kind of in this customer journey, right? You know, a customer doesn't end at, uh, they, they don't stop being important at acquisition. Mm -hmm. They don't stop being important at the first kind of, uh, um, you know, milestone. Mm -hmm. right? They're important all the way through, right? And they're, and they're, they're valuable, they're va they're value, we value them so much that we're like, hey, you know what, if we're going to build an organization and we're going to have a tool that expands all across that, we want to be able to have kind of every person be a stakeholder, mm -hmm. right, and be able to work on it collaboratively, right? Mm -hmm. And this is truly collaborative. If you think about the way our organization is set up, we have marketing, we have customer success, um, but there isn't one person who's just running a marketing automation, mm -hmm. right? Um, you, you have Winnie on the acquisition side, right? You have, you have, you have me um, on, on the content side. You have Kevin seamlessly picking up off of where he works. There's, there's no like, there's no like, I own this tool and, and you have to come to me. It's like, this is a very democratic tool. It's, it's really yeah, cool. I think Kevin explains it really, really well when he, well, I, like I mentioned earlier, in the past you would have to, like, like you said, go to, go to the marketing team if you're on customer success to get something done. But here, you know, we, we make it more KPI or goals based where marketing has the goal of conversion and we have the goal of getting them onboarded. So let's, let's use all the tools that, are, um, that, that, that we have. Um, I mean, so in one element, when you're using automation, you kind of have the keys. You have the launch, the keys, the launch code, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is great power. You can you can, <laughs> you can immediately reach your entire user base. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you had any lessons learned along the way in terms of how to ensure that, as you do have this more delegated use, that um, everyone's uh, you avoid the eventual mistake that everyone makes when using automation tools of sending the wrong message at the wrong time? and some way in which you've been able to sort of uh, uh, manage that or contain that as you grow? Um, in the marketing side, we never mess up. Um, <laughs> uh, and if our founders are listening, we never mess up. <laughs> yep. okay, yeah, so that's, that's, we never send the wrong message. So wrong. Um, yeah, I mean, come on. There's, there's always times when... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's always times when there's like, oh, might have forgot that criteria. Or maybe it's more specific, <laughs> more, more specific question. Do you have a concept of owners for different journeys or emails or different elements of the, pl of the, of the overall life cycle? Yeah, I think anything that's pre-conversion customer success doesn't touch, we don't even look at. <laughs> no, um, and then everything, I think, at, up until this point, that's post-conversion -conver is uh, customer success. Yeah, yeah. Is that it's, pretty, it's pretty easy. There's a, there's a really good line there. All right. Well, um, sort of maybe just as a, as a kind of a closing point here, we'll advance to um, this slide. I mean, we took some time mm -hmm. on the autopilot side to wrap up the conversation we've had with you in the last week preparing for this webinar mm -hmm. and really are uh, genuinely impressed by the results that you've shown, um, 18x customer acquisition growth and scale of a small team, 30% increase in new user activation at the, at the scale of thousands of customers on board weekly, and extremely high opens and click rates through personalization, segmentation, and testing. I'd be curious, maybe sort of from each of you, one, uh, you, know, uh, you know, especially Brandon, you've spent a couple of years now yeah. really building this out, trying different things. What sort of one uh, pearl or key takeaway you've seen that's resulted in a nice increase in uh, some level of performance conversion somewhere through? And, like I said, um, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things that I'm really excited about, you know, being able to use a tool like this is you get a chance, you don't, have, like, the whole methodology piece and kind of logical flow is really, really important because you don't get in your own way, mm -hmm. right? You're able to be agile, fast, and test quickly mm -hmm. rather than having to plan, 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 and mm -hmm. then implement, mm -hmm. right? This is more like, hey, you know what? I, I feel like this, this might work today. This might be a fun thing to do. Try it out. Mm, doesn't work. It works. It's okay because there's, it, it's, just, it's so agile to be able to do that. So what we found is you know, very early on, we were able to test a lot mm -hmm. very, very quickly. And, 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 and what I mean by that is, like I said, I've used, I've been, I've used best of breed marketing automation tools before in the past, mm -hmm. the previous ones, like, all of them, name them, right? Yeah. And there's always this kind of lead up to, okay, we're gonna, are we going to do this? Okay, we're, we're going to do this. We have to commit to this. And we're going to commit to this. We're going to do this. And then there's, there's feedback. And then you get, okay, then you have to go through the same cycle over and over again. With Autopilot, it's been able to like really scale our efforts, allow us to test very, very quickly so we get to get, get into like real data, get it back, mm -hmm. and just implement, right? And, and implement quickly and, and into a final form. Right? Got it. Yeah. And like what's one tactical takeaway you found has been really effective that you didn't know before? Oh, gosh. I mean, um, you know, one of the things that you're always afraid of is, I come from a world um, previously, I, I did use a high user acquisition B2C, but um, previously to, to, to RangeMe, it was all like 
very, very heavy demand generation, mm -hmm. the enterprise demand generation. So flipping it over and not being afraid to convert people at the first point of entry, mm -hmm. that's a very difficult, like yeah. you don't realize how, how nerve wracking that is for yourself, right? Because it's like, okay, you know what? Like, do we have, do I have enough value yeah. that I can convert immediately? Right. Um, and you know, a, a lot of times there's, you, you know, you, when you're doing demand generation for enterprise, like you have these long, like, like not painful, but like they're just very long nurture cycles because before you show value, you have to educate, mm -hmm. right? And I think that what we realized was like with these guys, you know, if we, if we get it right and we have a nice concise message that gets directly to the point, we can go direct to, to acquisition mm -hmm. um, without having to go through these long cycles. And that, that was one of the biggest learnings that we had. It was, I mean, it was, it was in B2B, it's almost unheard of, right? Right, to, right. To, to get to that point. And, and we, I think we were really proud to be able to accomplish that, you know. Great. Yeah. And uh, Kevin, from your perspective, um, what's been an interesting takeaway or learning you've had since using automation and uh, autopilot for your, you know, a key part of your overall program yeah. process? Yeah, I, I don't think I can talk enough about really understanding your customer, um, but it may take uh, a few A-B tests to understand what really motivates them. So it's okay to, to, to really um, work on that and figure out what voice and, and what I don't know what, what their customer's goal is and how you can leverage that motivation um, to educate them. I, I think there's this whole sect of customer success that, that is education marketing, and it, it makes it a lot easier when, when they're motivated. Right. Great. Well, listen, I think um, you've <laughs> given us a lot here today. You've, uh, you've dropped a lot of gems. Uh, we've also had fun going through this with you. So, um, you know, I just want to take some time to thank you both for joining today. Um, you know, I think it's, again, I think Range Me is doing a lot of great things um, at a tactical level and strategic level, and it's a, it's a pleasure to spend some time here with you this morning. Um, so thank you. And, um, and to the audience as well, it's been a pleasure having everyone on board. looks like everyone's been very active and very uh, engaged the entire time. So um, we will be posting the summary of this webinar and sending that around in a link as a follow-up so you can watch both the, uh, the replay and, um, and we can take questions offline as well. So at this point, I want to thank you all for joining us this morning, and uh, I'm going to hand it back to you, Derek. Awesome. Man, so many knowledge bombs there. And I thought I knew marketing automation going into this talk. You guys are clearly uh, very well versed in it. That was awesome. Uh, so thank you all. Um, yes, great talk. And if you guys are considering marketing automation uh, tools, I highly recommend Autopilot. We are now using it ourselves, and uh, it's been just phenomenal. And it's really great to learn about range.me and everything that you guys are doing, just uh, the growth story is insane. It's what, uh, what unicorns are made of. So uh, no. with it's actually, that, actually ra range me, range me, range yeah. me.com. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know why I said range.me. I was looking at the, 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 ad, the logo looks yeah, like a dog. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so thank you guys so much for joining us. We will see everybody here next week at the next growth marketing webinar hosted by Business to Community, Growth Marketing Conference, and Bullpine Interactive. Again, a special thanks to our sponsor of the day, Autopilot. I am Derek Haney from Bullpine Interactive. You can find me on the Twitters at, at Six Peppers. Don't ever hesitate to reach out, and we will see you guys next time.